and I was assigned to talk about history and biology of biosimilars. Uh, so the history is very recent history. On March 6th of this year, the Food and Drug Administration approved the first biosimilar in the United States. Zarxio is a biosimilar filgrastim. It's a biosimilar of the filgrastim made by Amgen, Nupagen, and it is a small protein, non-glycosylated, which in analytic studies was shown to be highly similar to Nupagen, and in pharmacokinetic studies and studies looking at uh, days with absolute neutropenia in patients receiving chemotherapy for breast cancer, the pharmacodynamics were shown to be highly similar. And based upon these data, the Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee recommended on January 17th that the FDA approve the drug, and it was approved on March 6th and was given the international non-proprietary name of Philgrastum hyphen SNDZ to indicate the manufacturer, Sandoz, uh, that manufactures the biosimilar to distinguish it from the originator, uh, Nupagen, which is made by Amgen and which has been called Philgrastum. So the history of biosimilars in the United States has just begun, and that's all that I can say about history in the United States since I have to leave the rest to Dr. Strand. But uh, I'd like to give some background uh, as to what are biosimilars. Biosimilars are defined in terms of the regulatory definitions. In the European Union, where the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, uh, published the first guidance document on biosimilars around 2005, the EMA defines a biosimilar according to this uh, definition, that it's a biologic medicinal product that contains a version of the active substance of an already authorized original biologic medicinal product, a so-called reference medicinal product. And they go on to say that a biosimilar demonstrates similarity to the reference medicinal product in terms of quality characteristics. And they use biologic activity, safety, and efficacy uh, based upon a comprehensive comparability exercise. The FDA issued the first guidance document, I think, in 2010, uh, which followed the legislation which outlines the pathway for biosimilar approval in the United States. Uh, the Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act of 2009 is Section 7002 of the Affordable Care Act, which was signed into law in March of 2010. So Obamacare, uh, for all the criticism that has been levied against it, provides us with a pathway for an abbreviated biologics license application for biosimilars. And the FDA defines a biosimilar as being that the biologic product is highly similar to the reference product, notwithstanding minor differences in clinically inactive components, and that there are no clinically meaningful differences between the biologic product and the reference product in terms of safety, purity, and potency. So the EMA talks about biologic activity, safety, and efficacy. The FDA talks about safety, purity, and potency. And that's a regulatory definition that was imposed upon the agency by the US Congress uh, when it voted into law the Affordable Care Act. The term biosimilars is used in the United States, uh, and it's also used in Australia. Uh, but there are other terms to describe these molecules. In the European Union, they're called similar biological medicinal products. The WHO, in its guidance uh, document, proposed the term similar biotherapeutic product. In Brazil, biosimilars are called merely biologic products. In India, they're called similar biologics, and the uh, Indian regulatory agency has a pathway for approval of biosimilars, but that pathway is not as stringent as the pathway in the United States or the European Union. So similar biologics approved in India are biosimilars according to the fact that they've been approved according to a pathway, but they're not equivalent as biosimilars necessarily to a biosimilar that's been approved by the European Medicines Agency or the FDA because the requirements in India are less stringent than those in the European Union or the United States. In Mexico, the Mexican regulatory agency calls these biocomparables, and in Canada, they're called subsequent entry biologicals. So there are a variety of names, varying terminology to describe the same thing. 
we can describe biosimilars. My mother-in-law is very nice, and she talks about people in terms of what they are not. You know, so someone's not, someone who's not very intelligent is another nice way of saying that someone's rather dull in terms of their intelligence. So biosimilars are not uh, second-generation biopharmaceuticals. They are structurally uh, second-generation biopharmaceutical. An example is uh, adalimumab or golimumab being a second-generation biopharmaceutical compared to infliximab. So these are structurally different from the originally licensed biopharmaceutical, and they are designed with the intent to improve performance while preserving the mechanism of action. A biosimilar is not significantly structurally different from the originally licensed biopharmaceutical. Biosimilars are also not intended copies or biomimics. I was pleased to hear Artie using the term biomimics. Uh, this is a term that Vivica and several others and I coined in a room in Lisbon about a year ago. And these biomimics are replicas of drugs, but they've not been subjected to a regulatory pathway for biosimilars. So these are copies, but they're not developed, assessed, or approved according to regulatory guidelines for biosimilars. And similarity has not been demonstrated by a comprehensive stepwise pathway uh, as is required by the European Union, the EMA, or the US FDA. And I'll leave that to Vibica to describe the pathways. Uh, there may be differences in the primary structure compared to the reference product, and these biomimics can differ in terms of formulation, doses, dosing regimen, efficacy, safety, and immunogenicity, whereas true biosimilars are not allowed to be developed at other than the dose for which the reference product is approved and marketed and have to be highly similar in terms of efficacy, safety, uh, and immunogenicity. Marketed biomimics based on biologic agents to treat inflammatory diseases are listed here. There are two rituximab biomimics. Reditux is manufactured by Dr. Reddy's laboratory in Hyderabad, India, has been marketed since 2007 in India as, and also in Bolivia, Chile, Ecuador, and Peru. It has been used to treat non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and then without studies to look at its efficacy in rheumatoid arthritis, was marketed in India to treat rheumatoid arthritis uh, and uh, it, it's still available there. Uh, Kikuzabam is or was manufactured by ProBiomed in Mexico and was withdrawn from the market in Mexico in March of 2014 because of an unacceptably high incidence of anaphylactic reactions occurring in patients treated with this biomimic. Uh, before Mexico issued its regulations and guidelines on biosimilar evaluation and approval, the Mexican government social security agency signed a multi-million dollar contract with ProBiomed to provide all of the rituximab for federal employees as kikuzabam rather than uh, rituxam. Uh, Etanercept biomimics, there are two. ProBiomed in Mexico makes Infinitiam, and then Shanghai CP Guozhan Pharmaceuticals in Shanghai, China has marketed Yisepu in China since 2005. And in Colombia, that same biomimic is marketed under the name of Etanar. In India, it is marketed as Etacept, and in Mexico, it is marketed as Etart. So these are biomimics. These are not biosimilars. When we talk about biosimilars, we're talking about molecules that have been evaluated and approved according to comparability exercises and regulatory pathways about which Vibica will speak. Biosimilars are also not generics. Generics are small molecules that have identical chemical structure to the reference product, and because biologic agents are complex, large macromolecules, it's not possible for a biologic to be identical in chemical structure by definition. And biosimilars are regulated according to the Hatch-Waxman Act of 1984, uh, where approval of the generic is based on demonstration of pharmacokinetic bioequivalence and may rely on clinical data from the reference product. So they can approve a generic small molecule without any clinical studies if there is enough data to show pharmacokinetic equivalence and chemical identity. 
So biosimilars are biopharmaceuticals. They're versions of already authorized biopharmaceuticals, similar in physical chemical characteristics, biologic activity, pharmacokinetics, efficacy, and safety, and a stepwise demonstration of similarity by a comprehensive comparability exercise is required to demonstrate biosimilarity. These are highly similar to the originator or reference products. They are developed intentionally to match the reference product, and they exhibit a range of structural similarities to the reference products. Recombinant proteins are highly similar, and some small peptides that are not modified with post-translational modifications can be identical, but usually biosimilars are highly similar to the reference product. The global status of biosimilar guidelines is shown here, and you can see that the United States, European Union, a number of other countries all have biosimilar pathways about which Dr. Strand will speak. Uh, the WHO issued draft guidance in October of 2009, which is the basis for many of these biosimilar pathways. The current state of the biosimilars market is shown in this table. There are six different erythropoiesis stimulating agent biosimilars, five of which are approved in the European Union and one in Japan. There are eight different granulocyte colony stimulating factor biosimilars, seven of which are approved in the European Union and one in Japan. There is a human growth hormone biosimilar approved both in the European Union and Japan. There is a TNF-alpha inhibitor, the same molecule manufactured by two different company or by one company and marketed by two companies that's approved in the European Union and a number of other countries, a follicle stimulating hormone uh, and an insulin glargolin biosimilar. Evibica will talk about CTP13. Uh, there are four biosimilar abbreviated biologic license applications that have been filed with the FDA. Uh, it, one of them is Remsima and Fliximab of Celtrion. There is an approved biosimilar in Fliximab in India that is developed by Epirus and has been approved since September of 2014. There's another approved biosimilar, Etanercept, that is approved in South Korea since November of 2014, and in India there's an approved adalimumab, although it's a similar biologic rather than a biosimilar that's been reviewed by the FDA and the EMA, and this was approved in December of 2014. There are a number of biosimilar cytokine inhibitors in development to treat inflammatory diseases. There are five publicly acknowledged adalimumab biosimilars in development. There are eight different etanercept biosimilars that are publicly acknowledged to be in development, three additional infliximab biosimilars besides those that have already been approved, and one tocilizumab biosimilar, which is publicly disclosed as being in development. There are nine different rituximab biosimilars that have been in development. Two of the studies have prematurely ended. Uh, one of these is in preclinical studies, but you can see that there are a lot of biosimilar candidates that are being developed. The biology, uh, protein structure, there are four levels of protein structure, primary structure, which is the amino acid sequence, secondary structure, which are alpha helices and other uh, hydrogen bonding conformations, uh, tertiary structure, which is caused by folding of the protein disulfide bonds, and then quaternary structure is assembly of the subunits into a larger functional macromolecule. All of these levels of protein structure have to be duplicated for a biosimilar to be truly biosimilar to the reference product. All biopharmaceuticals have variability, and there are a number of different uh, changes that can occur shown on the left here, which can lead to inactivation of a protein or increased immunogenicity, such as aggregation. There are also uh, post-translational modifications that are necessary for function, and if any of these change significantly between the reference product and the biosimilar, it's not a biosimilar. There have been changes in manufacture of reference products, not of biosimilars, but of biopharmaceuticals that have resulted in changes in immunogenicity. There was a change in the cell line in which an interferon beta-1A was produced that resulted in decreased immunogenicity. And then there were changes in the formulation of an erythropoietin of EPREX, where it was the protein stabilizer was changed from human serum albumin to polysorbate 80, and then a tungsten-containing rubber stopper syringe was used, and this caused aggregation of the erythropoietin. 
development of antibodies to erythropoietin, and because erythropoietin is a non-redundant human hormone, the antibodies resulted in pure red cell aplasia in 175 patients, a number of whom died. These changes no longer occurred when they were reverted to the original stabilizer and the original syringe. The most biosimilars are not identical to the reference product, uh, and proteins produced by recombinant DNA can have different terminal amino acids depending on the cell type, but these are cleaved before the final protein is processed. There are process changes that occur in the manufacturing of the original molecule, the originator. Small modifications may result in gradual changes in the protein. Uh, and there was a study that was done by Martin Schiestel and colleagues at Sandoz and published in Nature Biotechnology in 2011, looking at batches of uh, erythropoietin, rituximab, and um, the long-acting uh, version of erythropoietin, uh, and darbopoietin. And what they found was that before and after changes in manufacture, there were differences in charge. Here you can see in the middle that there are fewer basic variants after the, chart, after the change in manufacture, and there's more G0 glycan formation after the change. And despite these differences, the products didn't require a change in label, and no major differences were noted in terms of their clinical efficacy uh, in clinical use. If large alterations occur, then clinical trials are required to compare the process change uh, to the original manufactured product. The goal of biosimilar development is to develop a product highly similar to the reference product and comparing batches of rituximab pre and post change, before change and after change, there's more G0 glycan, three times as much, and this resulted in a change in antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. Uh, more potent ADCC. However, there are reference ranges for manufacture of a protein. So before the change, the reference range was as shown here. After the change, the quality control reference range is shown here, and the biosimilar is developed in comparison to the current reference product range. So the range for control of the biosimilar is smaller than the range of variation between the reference product when it was first manufactured and its current manufacturer. So in conclusion, biosimilars are biopharmaceuticals that are highly similar to their reference products. Many biosimilars of biologic agents to treat inflammatory diseases are in development. Biosimilar infliximab has been approved in many countries, but not yet in the United States and changes in manufacture of the originator biopharmaceuticals have resulted in variation in structure, so-called drift. So to talk about how biosimilars are evaluated, uh, the regulatory requirements, the issues of extrapolation of indications, immunogenicity, and interchangeability, uh, Vibika Strand will take the podium. Thanks.